Hi, very good morning to you. It's Jim from Avstar Observatory. I want to go through a few things with you guys. Hopefully you will get something out of this video and that will stretch in the line of probably um, giving you some confidence in what events are going to take place and when they are likely to take place in the near future and how they're going to directly affect you. One thing you've got to remember is that we are different from other YouTube channels. We've got our own equipment, we've been monitoring the positioning of the Magnetic North Pole for a good four years now and all our findings are on our website poleshiftnews.com um, so you can have a look at the archive how the Magnetic North Pole has been progressing with regards to our TriMag equipment. You can have a look at some of the magnetometers that we've got here in the UK and other parts around the world. Again, all that information regarding the data we've collected is up on the website for you to view and there is an archive of it so you can see over the years that we've been collecting the data from specific locations what has been going on with that. Now uh, you know in the last few videos we've been talking about um, the progression of the magnetic north pole and it approaching a single point uh, of interest which is the 40 degree mark. For those of you that are new to the channel that 40 degree mark is a theoretical um, mark that we've placed on the northern hemisphere and the reason why we put that there is because based on some experiments we know that when say things like compasses come into the vicinity of an affecting magnet source they will be pulled towards that, that source. If you slowly rotate that source that magnetic source what you'll see is the magnetic compass needle will migrate after it gets to 40 degrees so it's in the nature of uh, compasses and things that have magnetic uh, abilities to migrate and, and I say the compass is the best one really uh, for us to do this experiment with what you find is it crosses what's known as weak field lines when it get, enters the weak field lines it then rapidly migrates over you can do this experiment yourself with a simple compass and a magnet um, by just rotating the magnet in the vicinity of the compass it, it will uh, go from the strong field lines which holds it on a course slowly migrating uh, but once it gets past that 40 degree mark it migrates very quickly one of the common questions I have is where are the new magnetic north poles going to be on our earth what I can tell you is that our magnetic north pole is migrating towards central Russia right now just below um, the um, Arctic Circle in Russia is a vicinity where the it's probably one of the most highest intensities of magnetism that is measured on our planet. It's around 60,000 nanoteslas. And our magnetic north pole on this Earth is or has been tracking a corridor which we can see in this um, image that I'm showing you of Google Earth. It has been tracking in that straight line constantly since the 1900s. So we know why the poles are migrating, first of all, because they was fixed over Canada. At some point, Canada's intensity was greater than that of Russia's. But over the last 120 or so years, uh, Russia's intensity has been increasing. And it is for that reason that the magnetic north pole started to migrate. Now, we have two intensities which I want to show you on the next map. But neither of these are the actual point at where your compass will be pointing it is actually in somewhere in between you know based on experiments we found out that our compass doesn't point to a, a magnetic intensity it actually points in between the fields of two intensities one over Canada one over Russia so I can say this to answer that question that for now it does seem very much that the magnetic North Pole is heading towards Russia central Russia and if we don't see any other intense um, magnetic field pop up from now to the point where it does migrate faster, then for now we can say the new magnetic north pole at the moment seems to be that on the continent of Russia, somewhere central just below the Arctic Circle. So <clears throat> for now we know where it's heading, we know why it's heading in that direction. But we also know that whilst it's uh, travelling over the Northern Hemisphere, we know 
uh, that the magnetosphere, which is our primary shield against cosmic radiation, is weakening also. So we have a problem to face with that alone. We also know that as uh, increased cosmic rays come into our upper atmosphere, they certainly seem to create what is known as seeding effects, which allows uh, condensation nuclei or water nuclei to form tiny little droplets and grow. And as a result of these extra cosmic rays forming seeding platforms, we have altered um, we have altered um, the jet streams over the polar and subtropical regions, both over the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere of our Earth. So we have modified climate as a result of the cosmic rays. We also have a problem with co extra cosmic rays in our upper atmosphere because they can come down to the surface and they can increase cancer rates. They can also, as we have found out in the last 20 years, they are also able to alter the cardiac arrhythmosis of um, you know, not just human beings, but uh, you know, animals across the range. So it does pose some threat, uh, threats to us directly. Um, before I go on any further, I just want to say a big thanks to those few people over the last few days who have been supporting the research that we've been undertaking at the observatory. And you know, I just wanted to do this video um, to give some answers to some of those questions that you have been having, probably. Uh, tick over in the back of your mind so I just want to give you some um, you know clear um, you know answers to those questions so you know with regards to the magnetic north pole we know where it's going to be certainly in the future and for now it looks like it will be you know tracking and probably stay there in Russia somewhere um, unless other intensities start to pop up and according to some of the research that has been done on uh, previous magnetic reversal, reversals or excursions, it's not uncommon when the poles start to go into their weak field lines for many uh, intensities to pop up all around the world. And you know, it is for that reason that we could see six or even several uh, magnetic poles at that point in time. Uh, it will just be after you know, it reaches some form of equilibrium that it will settle back down into two poles. And usually, according to, you know, um, the uh, geology that we've studied uh, in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, where lava solidifies, the magnetite in that, as it solidifies, points out clearly that these poles have reversed uh, from north to south many times so there's no reason why we shouldn't expect that to take place but what we are really concerned about here is what happens during the reversal you know when the magnetosphere um, massively reduces more cosmic radiation will for that reason be inbound and we have to think about what that will what effects that will have on ourselves so i just want to show you where the intensities are now on a map so you get a clear idea of where they are so we're looking just for reference uh, at the World Magnetic Model uh, 2020. It's a couple of years old, but for just, just for now, it gives you a good idea. I have got the most recent one, but just for now, it gives you a good idea of where those intensities are right now on our planet. We can see the one over in Canada at around about 55,000 nanoteslas. We can see the one over Russia. 60,000 nanoteslas and it is the Russian one that is winning the pole which is somewhere in between the two over Canada and Russia. It's somewhere central at the moment so that's what we're tracking uh, every month on the 17th on our channel with the TriMag system. You can see towards the equatorial region over Brazil we have what is known as the South Atlantic Anomaly. It's around 20,000 uh, nanotesla. It's the weakest field on our planet and you can see that it is splitting into two as it, as it uh, deviates over South Africa. Uh, then bottom right hand corner, uh, just below Australia, you can see another intensity of around about 55,000 nanoteslas. Uh, that is your safe pole, where the safe pole is. And you might be thinking, well, okay, we can see there's an epicenter around the one in the safe pole and the pole is in the center of it. So why isn't that the case for the one then uh, in Russia? And Canada, well, we don't have a positive, if you want to call it positive, um, magnetic anomaly uh, on the other lower left hand side of this chart. If we did, that magnetic pole would be somewhere in the center, like it is over the northern hemisphere. 
So you can see why the poll has been migrating to Russia because the intensity has been getting stronger and it is actually winning the dipole. You could do this experiment at home with two magnets and a compass in the center of the two magnets. You would see why the compass then clearly points in between the two intensities over our planet. So what we do have, as you can see, is clearly three uh, magnetic poles on our planet, all three major intensities and one which is very low. And it is why we're interested in getting a magnetometer into Brazil because we want to see what's going on in a region that has very little protection with regards to magnetic intensity. Comparing it with Russia, there is 40,000 nanoteslas of lower strength in the South Atlantic anomaly than there is right over central Russia right now. And you know we want to see what sort of radiation is actually raining down right now on Brazil because this gives us an idea of what to expect with regards to an increase in radiation as the magnetosphere weakens more. Um, what can we do about the radiation and is there anything at, at the moment we could do to protect ourselves from radiation? Well you are never ever going to stop it but there are companies that work alongside uh, organisations like NASA that do specialise in radiation protective suits and these would be the suits that if there was you know like a broken arrow uh, you know there was an aircraft mission taking place and there was an accident because it was carrying nuclear bomb and maybe the casing uh, broke you know this company would provide suits for them let me show you the company I'm talking about so we're over here on the website of Astrorad and they're in the business of shielding our astronauts from as you can see space space-borne radiation so they they make protective suits for all different applications you can have a quick read of it or go onto their website and just have a look about you know if you are interested more in the materials they use how they do their shielding and things like that there is at least you know some information there that maybe you might be able to adapt in the future because you know this is something that we're all going to have to deal with it's not just going to be a problem uh, like it is now for astronauts as the magnetosphere starts to weaken more it is probably going to stop any space exploration uh, at least along the lines with human beings doing it uh, until that magnetosphere regains its full strength that's if it does and you know why I say that don't you because if we look at Mars it lost its magnetosphere never regained it again and possibly is the reason why it looks like it does today you know no atmosphere no water on its planet and certainly no known life um, but yeah there is some protection that you can uh, get you're never going to block it out completely and uh, I don't know how much or, or how well these uh, space or radiation suits would be um, in, in a situation where the magnetospheres you know goes down to say let's say 10% uh, how much protection it would offer uh, one other thing that I've been uh, looking into because it's going to affect us all is you know as we uh, go closer into the Milenkovitch cycle we know because of what we've been doing on the sidelines is studying the effects of our planet going back into a glacial period we are 6,000 years at least back into that Milenkovitch cycle and for that reason, you know, the Northern Hemisphere is going to change on our planet. It's just bad luck that, you know, all these things come together at the same time, like a grand solar minimum, um, a magnetic pole reversal, and then a returning back into a glacial period. You know, we are going to have to change and adapt to these new uh, situations that we are inevitably going to find ourselves in. And you can understand, I suppose, to some degree why these bigger organisations like NASA, NOAA, the European Space Agency, really aren't talking about this too much. Because you can imagine people would panic. And when there is very little uh, or near to nothing that can be done about it to prevent it, these things happening, you know, it sort of like would change, I suppose, the per, you know, a human being's outlook on, you know, future um, life and how you know it could, it could probably demotivate them completely um, but I think you know it's always a good idea to know what you're faced with and do the best you can because you know that is the optimistic approach to you know being successful if you give up and you're pessimistic you know you, you've failed to even have a go to start with haven't you 
and you know what we try and encourage people to do is just at least do some simple things in preparing for the future coming events because they are without a doubt going to arrive um, and have done already for a lot of people it's just a matter of luck real luck that it hasn't affected us all yet because I guarantee you it will it will affect you it will affect your children and their children to come the life that they're going to be living is going to be completely different to the life that we are going to be living but I suppose for a lot of us we want to just try and hold on to what we've got and, and have an enjoyable life right now and I think with all what we're seeing go on around the world like rising food prices you know you could offset that with a little bit of your own gardening you know and growing of a bit of foods you know energy is another thing and I've been investing a lot of time looking into how we can power our homes should the grid go down or even just to save some money because let's face it with everything going up and wages not going up then we're having to make the most of what we've got now one of the things like I said I've been looking into over the last couple of weeks is um, the best methods of producing electricity for our homes at least that's what I've been looking at um, now a couple of things I've found I'll show you actually uh, in the next few uh, uh, screenshots so what we're looking at is just a simple diagram of a setup of a solar panel array and you've got your charge your solar panels connected to your charge controllers they will go to breakers before they go to the inverters you've also got the addition here of a generator which can go into the system and then these go from the inverters into your homes as electricity but I will say this um, there are different ways of doing this you can use the solar panels on your roof uh, and, and grid tie them so you're just selling all the energy that you create off your roof off your own solar panels to the grid and they will send you a check every three months I think the maximum you can get is about 90% off them anyhow I don't know why they only give you 90% of the actual energy that they sell you but that's another issue for another day on this system you can see that it's also got a battery bank they're very very expensive now if you're like me uh, we're not perfectly situated south and what I've been doing over the last few weeks is because of the energy bills uh, rising you know now they're near enough two thousand and eighty pounds a year I worked out just my gas and electricity for the home so I've been looking seriously now at how I can bring those costs down and you know I thought well you know I could I could go off grid with the generator but then you've got to fuel the generator okay we can buy what's called red diesel in the UK which is diesel that has the duties um, that the government collect taken off it or reduced anyhow so you know you buy cheaper fuel by I think one third uh, but even diesel's going up you know over the years um, I did run my old Land Rover off central heating fluid but to do that you need to add engine oil to it so you just mix engine oil to the central heating fluid to thicken it up and make it a little bit heavier and the way we got it uh, we got it perfectly right I mean I mean central heating fluid is quite cheap it's cheaper than red diesel and um, you know we mixed the engine oil we've done some vaporized tests so we could see how it's rising up the paper the filter paper that we've got and we got it perfect anyway I won't go into that if you want to know more about converting centrally in fluid into usable diesel then you know we just put it in the comment section we'll talk about how I did that but that's one way so yeah you know the thing is with batteries is they're absolutely expensive they have come down over the last 20 years in price because the technology's got better some of these companies that sell these batteries uh, offer a guaranteed 10 years warranty on the batteries and they say that they would last 20 years so I suppose if you brought you know uh, five or six thousand pounds worth of these batteries they would keep you going for um, you know 10 or 15 years at least but it's very expensive uh, I've been looking at costs and all this uh, with regards to this your inverter you can get an inverter that manages the uh, solar charge um, controller so it's a charge controller it's an inverter and it also uh, splits the power back off into your batteries it's like a computer that runs everything they're about off the top of my head 
$800, I think Glowworm do those, uh, or Glow something uh, is the company. You can, you, there's plenty of videos on YouTube showing you how to build your own solar array in any case. But, you know, I think if you're independent with your own energy, right now, it's not gonna be a bad thing. The only thing is, it does cost a lot of money. So just for instance, I can buy a 150 watt solar panel for 119 pounds. I can buy one of these batteries uh, for $1,700. It's a 48 volt, 100 amp, 5.1 kilowatt battery. I know it sounds expensive, but there is other ways of doing it. I was gonna make my own batteries uh, in series and in parallel and build the whole thing, but when I worked it all out, it was, it was cheaper to buy the manufactured battery that had breakers, uh, battery management control units in them. Uh, when you start looking into this stuff, it gets really technical. But there would be an initial outlay, but what I was thinking of doing is I couldn't afford to do this right off, and it'd probably take me months anyhow to save up the money for just a simple uh, setup with one battery, probably four or five solar panels and a charge converter. So, you know, probably six months it'd take me to save up for that. Uh, and I was thinking of just adding to the system when I could afford to, so I would always put a little bit of money aside for, you know, buying the next three solar panels or something like that. I think that's the way for that's the way I, I could only afford to do it, rather than you know take a loan out and splash for probably ten or fifteen thousand pounds on a solar system. And then I've got the other problems is we're not perfectly safe facing, so the roof isn't going to be in optimal performance. So you're probably not going to be pulling 115. Uh, watts, oh sorry, 150 watts of power through the solar panel. It's going to probably be more along the lines of 100, maybe even less, on a, on a, any good given day. Uh, for the fact that we got cloud, uh, it's not always sunny and blue skies. The panels wouldn't be in perfectly alignment with the sun, etc., etc. So I think with the roof space I've got. And with enough solar panels, I mean, I'll just give you an idea. When you start working out all the watts that your house uses, I mean, just for instance, I've got a fridge and I've got a, free, a freezer, a separate fridge freezer. And those two would consume in 24 hours um, 1.4 kilowatts. And to get 1.4 kilowatts off the solar panels, I'll probably need about 14 of them. So that's just the run, a fridge and a freezer. These are the things that are on all the time in my house and like yours, there would be as well. So, you know, they're, you know, you've got to start working out what you need and, you know, what you're prepared to live with if you want to do this. Um, I know when, when the solar companies come into your house, they sell you or the, the, uh, the dream of you not only running your own home uh, completely off grid, but they also say, oh, you know, you'll be able to create more electricity on top of that and not only charge up your Tesla car, but also charge up, you know, uh, the grid as well. So you get a check off them. It doesn't work out like that. Uh, you know, I, I have seen a lot of systems and, you know, here in the UK, I suppose we would have to definitely include the probably a 5 kVA generator uh, to, to top up those batteries on a, you know, a cloudy day. So you'd have to, you know, probably include one of them in your system in some parts of the world where you live. But the important point is this. I have got, I'll just say, an uh, 18 watt solar panel and a small battery bank. And with that, I can charge up my phones, my laptops and a few of the little things. Uh, it's not a very powerful solar panel. Maybe if we just all add one solar panel for emergencies, that wouldn't be a bad thing. Uh, so maybe in the future on this channel, we're going to look at the cheapest system that can do, you know, a, a, a meaningful amount of uh, usefulness. Uh, because I think we all we all are going to uh, face problems in the future with, you know, grid problems. And if grids go down, you can imagine how important the mobile phone is to a lot of us. You know, just not having a mobile phone charged uh, means we can't do banking, can't answer our emails if we're on the move, etc., etc., etc. So I think it's important that we have something that can charge those back up. Um, but for a lot of us, all this technology is out of um, our grasp because the cost of it. 
And in, trust me, I have invested 20, 25 years on looking at all of the alternatives of producing electricity. If you remember a couple of weeks ago, I, I, I produced a video where I showed you all the means and methods we've got at our hands today of producing electricity. I, I didn't show you all the different promises that people have uh, come out with and claims that they've made that they've become uh, able to now get to zero point energy. It just doesn't work and it goes against all of um, known science. Let's just say that, yes, there are semi-perpetual uh, things I could tell you about, like things you know. I mean, you could say that semi-perpetual uh, motion does exist because this Earth has been flying around the sun for the last millions and millions of years. And, you know, you could say that that was perpetual. Uh, okay, the sun shines every day. So, you know, for at least half of the 24 hours in a given day, you know, there is, um, you know, enough sun to charge up some solar panels or batteries off the solar panels. So um, it, you just end up going down rabbit holes if you're looking at zero point. I, I think, you know, you've got to come back to what we've got and and utilize that so you know that's why i wanted to do this video and we'll probably go into in depth a little bit more about different systems the cost of the systems etc etc but you know i think this is what we need to do we need to look at protecting ourselves from cosmic radiation we need to know what we're going to do when we see more of this earth's arable cropping land go offline and therefore food is going to get more expensive probably need to look at um you know creating little gardens of our own where we where we offset some of the food prices that are increasing as a result of the um you know the reduction in crops around the world and we're definitely going to need to you know come to some uh, understanding that we need to produce electricity in order to be first of all self-sufficient reduce the bills and you know in an emergency we have our own uh, supply that we can rely on so i think that's what we'll concentrate as well as keeping an eye on all the anomalies that are taking place with our planet like earthquakes volcanoes uh, co2 and everything else you know and uh, i just want to briefly say you know i did mention to my local member of parliament uh, about you know the uh, you know the recent um uh, infringements that google and youtube imposed on our channel so i've, I've got a meeting with him on the 4th of February so I'll keep you informed about what's going on there because you know I think it's important that we do um, you know concern ourselves with the infringements of our freedom so we're also tackling that problem as well here at the observatory so we really have our hands full uh, with all the things we need to do and go through so that you know you guys at the end of the day know what's coming you know how to protect yourselves as best as you possibly can and at the same time, we don't all lose our freedoms along the way. You know, we are facing, like I said, we would be five, ten years ago, the gauntlet. We're in the gauntlet now. We've already spanked into a couple of these obstacles in there. And it is not going to be um, uh, pleasant for all of us as we continue to go through it. And we certainly, certainly haven't reached any equilibrium yet. We've not got to the middle point of this where things start to improve. No equilibrium with the grand solar minimum. No equilibrium with the magnetic pole reversal. No equilibrium with the crisis of food production. And everything else, guys, on top of that, there is no equilibrium on any of these things. They're going to get worse. They're going to start affecting us all. And we need to prepare ourselves as best as we can with not just the things we will need, but the information we will need as well so that's what our uh schedule is going to be like for the next few months and years to come here if we're lucky um to do it and you know the there is a link down there if you want to help support what we do here it's very important that we get support because there is initial costs as you can imagine i don't know what got into some people on the last video i did but they started i think we've got a group of people that are um, trying to cause disruption in the comments section. I think we have, because all of a sudden we've been reaching uh, vaster audiences around the world, and I think we might have GCHQ on our back, and these are paid 
individuals to cause disruption on channels like this. We know that they're out for us because we talk about things like climate and CO2 being a load of bullshit, don't we? And we know that COP26 has been a big failure for world governments trying to raise that 100 trillion because people in other countries simply can't afford their uh, carbon taxes and, and uh, you know, plans to raise and raise that kind of money. Oh, when I worked it out the other day, the individual cost to us all, if they did manage to raise that money, would be you know in the, in the thousands, guys. And we are already, believe it or not, paying taxes somewhere along the line as a result of this scam that's going on uh, around the world. It's like they weren't even here. They weren't even hear the truth anymore. They've shut the conversation down because they're saying, look, we've had the independent... Um, expertise of thousands of scientists around the world that not mentioned who these scientists are I think they're all uh, some of these scientists uh, are people like Greta Thunberg you know I think that's where they're getting the information from kindergarten scientists but um, that certainly it's not scientifically uh, sound their conclusions and as a result you know they are as you would expect criminals to behave raising lots of money on the back of this so it's a topic for another day. We are very much still uh, trying to deal with this situation with, you know, at least the at the level of MPs. And hopefully we can try and make them see uh, some sense. Uh, but you know, oh, I, I don't have any hopes, but, you know, it doesn't stop me trying. Because at the end of the day, when money is concerned, you know, and the pigs are at the trough, what, what common sense is actually um, dispensed? You know as well as I know the answer to that. Not very much. So, guys, I think we've covered quite a bit. Hopefully, you've got something out of this video. There is a link down there. It's important. I can't emphasize that, that we all work together and support what we're trying to do here. And I know that people do benefit from this information. We may have even saved people's lives as a result of giving them this information that we have over the years. So, for that reason, I'm pretty sure you'll agree it's worth supporting, even if we haven't ourselves benefited from it at this point but I'm sure we all have got something from it so there's a link down there if you want to help support the only other thing for me to say is guys I'll be back in the coming days uh, we'll have a look at the earth health at a glance and I'll say what I usually do you know you take care start thinking about some of the things we've mentioned in this video and I'll say what I usually do bye for now